Okay, again, I'd like to welcome everyone to the worship service at Fancy Worship Center. The title of the message is at Antioch and Pisidia. And as you explore that, when we go through the message today, you're going to see there's a reason for that. But some people say, well, the Bible is just a book written. If something happens that is foretold in the, in the Bible, well, that was just a happy accident or coincidence. But really and truly, the Bible is a precise text. And the reason I say that is the, the title of part of the scripture talks about talks about uh, Antioch at Presidio. Well, everybody, everybody kind of has heard of Antioch before. They know, anybody who does anything with the New Testament knows that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas they were sent out by the church at uh, now I'm trying to find my, my scripture here but they found it they, it's a specific Antioch because what happens is if you look at the map the sending church of the church that uh The church that uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas went to, the sending church was the church in Antioch. It was in Syria. It was a Gentile church. But the church, the message is mostly about today is Antioch. It's right here. It's Pisidia. That's in the Jewish in, in Israel. And the thing about it is, is it so precise because if we'd just talked about Antioch and you would have not been able to differentiate between two peoples because one church is a Gentile church. The church at Antioch in Syria is a Gentile church. The church that we're going to talk about today mostly is Antioch at Pisidia and it's a, it's a Hebrew church. It's a, a, a Hebrew city and this, you know, they have a synagogue and stuff and uh, Antioch and uh, in Syria, they didn't have a synagogue necessarily. But we're going to look at it. We're going to look at the two different Antiochs here in, in their perspectives. They're very different. The Gentile dominant church at Antioch was a sending church of Barnabas and Paul. The other at Pisidia was a Jewish dominant city. Pisidia is predominantly Jewish and had a hard sell because they were looking for a lion to come. But instead, they got a lamb that was slaughtered and hung on a tree. Even though the scripture they read, every, and that's the other thing about the synagogues and the rabbis and the ones who, who read the scripture, and that's what they did at the synagogue on the Sabbath, is they read scripture, they studied scripture. They didn't so much worship as to just study, study God's word. But they didn't take it to heart. Evidently, if they had taken it to heart when Jesus was born in a stable, they would have been looking for him because they knew exactly when he was going to be, knew what the signs were, and knew the place he was going to be born, but they weren't looking for him. Same thing here in uh, Antioch, uh, Pisidia. They had read the scriptures. They had read all the prophecies. They had read the prophets and the law, and they should have known all this stuff, but they really weren't looking. And that's the problem is, somebody I talked to today said, well, I'm not religious. Well, I'm not religious either. I believe in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but not a particular religion or being religious by name, because when we do something out of religion, we're just doing it over and over again but are we doing it because we love the Lord and want to serve him or are we just doing it because well, that's the way we've always done it? But as I said, they, they didn't have, the uh, church at Antioch, the Gentile church, they didn't have the prophets, they didn't have the Mosaic law, they didn't have any of that stuff. And that was a good thing in a, in a way because they didn't have that baggage. They weren't trying to live up to what the uh, traditions of men and other rabbis and and if you start studying about rabbis and things 
Rabbis had followers, just as, as Paul or Saul of Tarsus had been a, a student of G Gamaliel, who was, a, who was a Pharisee. Each Pharisee had their followers, and they had different di uh, doctrines that they believed in, different things that they taught. And none of it, or some of it, or any of it, might not have been in accordance with Scripture. It was what such and such a rabbi thought, what such and such a Pharisee thought, not necessarily what the truth of the matter was. But that was that was what was happening. So you had the church at Antioch Pisidia, and Pisidia, they were saddled with the traditions of the rabbis and the, the Pharisees. But the Antioch and Syria, they didn't have that. But everything about Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, the crucified and risen Savior was an was new information to him. That was new information to the Gentile church. And the sad part is that both groups only needed to believe in Lord Jesus to be saved. They didn't have to do anything else. They just had to believe that he was virgin born, he lived a perfect sinless life, that he went to the cross, he shed his precious blood and died on the cross to pay for our sin debt, a debt he didn't owe and we could never pay. And then he was buried, and on the third day he was raised to never die again, giving us the promise of everlasting life through him. But the Gentiles, they worshiped, or they welcomed the truth, and the Jews resisted and rejected the truth of the gospel. Now, Acts 13, 14, and 15, it says, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, men, and when I read this last little bit of verse 15, I want you to think what the man was, the, the leader of the synagogue, he was taking his, his self in his hands when he said this. But he said, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on them. So this opened it up for Paul and Barnabas to do what they did. So, you know, the question was asked, why did uh, Paul go past uh, Perga without any reported uh, sharing of the gospel? Well, we don't know. And it's, uh, it talks about uh, Paul having affliction and that uh, Pisidia was 3,600 feet above sea level and it was a cooler climate and it gave him a little bit less problem. It said Paul wrote about the Galatian church that he spoke about an illness in Galatians 4.13. said that, you know, because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. I don't know, but his affliction was probably with his eyes. But the thing about it is, is when we looked at it, when it says, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say, say on. So that gives Paul the perfect opportunity to share the gospel with the Jewish, with the synagogue. And that's what he was looking for. That's what he always did. Even though he was the apostle to the Gentiles, he still, when he went into a, a, a city or town that had a synagogue, he went there first. He always went to his, his brothers and sisters first to share the gospel with them. Then, if it was rejected or partially accepted and partially rejected, then he would go to the Gentiles because Gentile, he was called to be the Gentile, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles. But in, again, in Galatians 4, 13, it says, you know that because I, a physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you for, at the first. Now, Paul's affliction it may have been affected his eyes in some way. Some think Paul had malaria, which left him with disabling headaches. This was described by the ancients as a red hot bar thrust through the forehead. Possibly this was what Paul meant when he referred to the thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 says, And lest I should exalt, be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. The whole thing about this thorn in the flesh was that uh, Paul and Bart, or Paul had been stoned and thrown off a cliff for dead. 
he was raised up into the third heaven, and we won't go into that scripture because it says he was drawn up to the third heaven. He saw things that that he was not supposed to to tell. So he he just figured that the the thorn in his flesh, whatever it was, it was a migraine headaches, it was an actual thorn in his flesh, whatever it was, was keeping him humble, keeping him in a position that he didn't get up and brag about what he had done. Because how many of, well, every time somebody thinks they had a, a close call with death, thinks they had a, a heavenly experience, and most of them, they come back and it was a fraud. But anyway, we're looking at it. But as I said, Antioch and Pisidia was a different city from the Antioch located just north of Palestine and, and Syria. Acts 11, 22 says, the news, then the news, these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go, go as far as Antioch. What had happened was the church in Jerusalem, the Jewish church in Jerusalem, the Jewish Christians, had heard that a Gentile city with a Gentile church, they were getting the word of God, they were getting the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they were believing, and they were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And the church in Jerusalem said, we need to check this out. Let's send Barnabas. So what happens, they sent Barnabas to check it out. And he said, man, you know, these guys here, they're, they're coming to faith in Jesus Christ. They're receiving the Holy Spirit just like we did when we believed. I'm going to run up to Tarsus. I'm going to find Saul and I'm going to bring him back. And we're going to do this ministry together. So that's what he did. And he went and got Saul and brought him back. So... No, that's, that's where we get to at Antioch. And they stayed at Antioch for a year, preaching God's word, teaching the gospel, and then they, they went out. But Antioch was eventually the sending church of Barnabas and Saul, as we saw in an earlier message. But Antioch was Paul's base of operation, based operation, because no matter what his travels took him, no matter where his travels took him, he always returned. Being called up by the Lord as the apostle to the Gentiles gave Paul a special calling. Though he was still burdened for his Jewish brothers that always taking the gospel to them first. Now Acts 13, 16 and 17 says, Then Paul stood up and just remembered in verse 15, the, the leader of the synagogue said, Hey, brothers, if y'all got something to say, stand up and say it. He, I'm sure he regretted that, that statement. Because this is what Paul started out with. He said, then Paul stood up, motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now in the next verses, Paul will be exhorting the Jews and preaching a message they didn't really accept and didn't want to hear. No one relishes the idea that they had a hand in killing the prophets and the ultimately killing the Messiah. Now remember, if you've read your study of your scripture, you'll see that what happened is the prophets of God, the, the true prophets of God, they came to the people and said, look, you need to stop doing this because if you don't stop doing this, this is what God's going to do to discipline you. And the people would say, we don't want to hear that. Tell us, tell us good stuff. Tell us good things. You know, make us happy. Don't tell us stuff that's going to cause us to have to change. You know, that's why a lot of people resist hearing the gospel because they're afraid they're going to have to change something in their life. They're going to have to quit looking at pornography. They're going to have to quit drinking excessively. They're going to have to quit doing all the things they do if they, they hear the gospel. And, and I, I've had people all around, you know, they just stop up their ears, just like the ones who stoned Stephen to death. They didn't want to hear the truth, so they stopped their ears and ran after him as a group. But the sad spiritual state of Israel is farther declared in Paul's sermon in the synagogue of this city. As for Peter, as for Peter on the day of Pentecost, Stephen before the council, Paul rehearses Israel's history. Now these three sermons, Peter's initial sermon after the Holy Spirit comes upon him at Pentecost, Stephen, the, the sermon he preached before they stoned him in Jerusalem, 
and Paul, when he's talking to the synagogue in, uh, in uh, Antioch, Pisidia. But it's really, really not a pretty picture of obedience, but a litany of dis disobedience and all around failure of the Jewish people, of the nation of Israel. Paul recounts all the failings of the Israelites and highlights the patience of the Lord in dealing with them. And I say it in here all the time, if, if we didn't have a patient God, a Lord who was patient with us, you would walk, be walking across the campus here and say, wonder what that pile of ashes is. Because he would act immediately to do it. If, if it was us, and we had that power to do to destroy like that, the power to create and the power to destroy, there would be a lot of piles of dust around here. Every time somebody cut us off in traffic, we, we would run through it and <laughs> dust would go everywhere. But God is patient with us. We may not think he's patient, but he is patient. And he does not want to do anything to us until the last possible minute, until there's no other other option. But he knows all the options. He, he knows the beginning from, from the end, so he, he's going to know what's going to happen anyway. But Paul recounts all the failings of the Israelites, highlights the patience, I said, of the Lord in dealing with them. Paul mentions something that was not found in the rest of the history, found in Scripture. And there, there's quite a few t texts in the New Testament and the Old Testament, but mostly in the New Testament, that we have books that were not inspired, but they were human, written down as human history or, or human text, not inspired by the Holy Spirit or superintended by the Holy Spirit. But we get extra biblical information in the, in the Bible. So because it's in the Bible, you can trust it. But it says, now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with the ways in the wilderness. What it's talking about is when he brought them out of, out of Egypt. Now, all the things God did to get the people out of Egypt, they should have been, when God said jump, they should have been wanting to just know how high to jump. But that was not the case. Well, let me finish reading the scripture. It says, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. Now what had happened is after the 40 years they came in, into the land, and they did, did claim land. God defeated seven nations for them, but they still resisted. But with Joseph, the second in command, With Joseph the second in command behind Pharaoh in Egypt, he was able to bring 75 Hebrews, 75 who, who became a multitude. Now, when we, we look at the time in, the time in uh, Egypt, what we see is initially, we know Joseph, he was a, the prime minister to the Pharaoh. He was the second in, in command. He was the second in power in, in Egypt. He brought his family in. But they only had 75 of them, counting Joseph and his sons. There were only 75 Hebrews that came into Egypt. When they came in, they stayed for 400 years. During that 400 year period, the Pharaoh who came on in power didn't remember what Joseph had done for the nation of Egypt. And uh, 75 Hebrews had multiplied into probably a couple of million Hebrews, and they were getting kind of scared because they were they were multiplying, and we see that. In, well, I'll go there. But they were multiplying; they were getting scared because they were scared that they would fight with their enemies if they came in. So they started persecuting. They started putting them in, uh, treating them as slaves. They they persecuted them, did all manner of things with them. But that's why they finally cried out cried out to God and he, he came to rescue them. But the 75 became a multitude and put fear into the hearts of the Egyptians that we read in Exodus 1, 7, 9. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. 
And he said to, the, to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. So they were, they were scared. I don't think they had any reason to be scared, but they were. They, you know, as far as I can tell, before they started uh, enslaving them, they were citizens of, of Egypt. They considered themselves citizens of Egypt. They weren't even talking about going back to, to Canaan. They, they were happy. They made a lot. And that's what happens with the Hebrews, no matter what. What befalls them, God gives them the capacity to prosper wherever they are. They prospered in Egypt and, and multiplied, and then the, the Egyptians got scared. When they were exiled from the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians, the vast majority of them prospered in exile. And when the southern kingdom was taken by Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar, they were taken into captivity. And they prospered too. That's why you had so many when, when uh, Darius and Cyrus sent them back to, uh, get back to Israel, back to their home, you had so many who stayed right where they were because they had made a life. They didn't want to go back and rebuild a, a demolished city rebuild a temple and rebuild a wall. They didn't want to do that. They wanted to stay where they were. But this this is a time when Pharaoh and the Egyptians decided to enslave the dom and dominate the Israelites. When they came, when the time came for Yahweh to rescue his people, it had been 400 plus years since they went in. When it was time to bring them out and lead them into the promised land, they were they were disobedient. They, they did exactly what Moses, God had told Moses to have them do as far as putting the, the lamb's blood on the, on the doorpost. They, they did all that. They picked up the stuff and they got out and the, the Egyptians were so glad to see them leave. They threw gold and stuff at them. But they got out, they went across the Red Sea. But it took two years to get them out and get them in shape. Then they sent 12 spies in to spy out the land, what happens? 10 of the spies come back and say, hey, we look, this, this, this place is full of milk and honey, it, it's great, but the people there are too big and too mean, too tough, too hard for us to deal with. We're just not going in. Then you had two, Joshua and Caleb said, hey, look, with God, and which is the key, with God, we can go in there, we can conquer this, we can do all this, we can take this, we can kick these people out and reclaim the land. But the people listened to the ten naysayers versus the two that said, hey, let's go for it. So God said, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're going to wander around for 38 more years in the wilderness. When all of you guys, 20, uh, 20 and above, when y'all die off, then I'll bring the people in into the promised land. And that's what happened. He marched around the wilderness for, for 38 more years until those who rebelled died out. So he, when he got ready to, to bring them into the, to the land of promise, he went from having a bunch of uh, people with a slave mentality to some who had a warrior mentality because that's what he needed to go in and claim the, the, the uh, promised land is a warrior mentality, not a, go in as a servant. In fact, if you look at scripture, out of that generation, the only two that made it into the promised land was Joshua and Caleb, the two spies who said, hey, we can do anything if God's with us. Now, this is Acts 13, 20 and 21. And this is still Paul talking. So said, after that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterwards, they asked for a king, so he gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. Now, some early manuscripts apply 450 years to the period before the judges, but this is referred to in 1719. But in either case, the intended extent of the time reference is vague. But what is important is not important and not vague is that the, at every turn the people fail. When they came out of the out of the wilderness, when they conquered the promised land, Joshua was in charge. Once they got to a certain point and Joshua died, 
they didn't have any strong leaders to come in and take the place. So what they did is they did exactly what they wanted to do. And God would call up when they'd have trouble, he would call up judges. These judges would lead the people to defeat your enemies through the power of God. And that was what was going on. And that was what the importance of the judges. But they got tired after the end of the judges because Samuel, when it talks about Samuel in the scripture, it says, uh, well, Samuel, he was the last judge and the first prophet of God. He was the one who anointed King Saul as king. He anointed the shepherd boy David as king. But he was... Uh, He was the one who was speaking for God at the time. But additional information tells us that the three kings ruled over the 12 tribes 40 years each. There is a lot of symbolism in the reigns of Saul, David, and Solomon. In Saul, we see a man in the flesh and the reign of sin. In David, we see grace poured out. In Solomon's reign, we see a future future day of glory, a picture of the reign of Christ in the millennial kingdom. That is without the 600 wives and the 300 concubines. But each of these favored kings failed in some parts of their reign, some more than others. Some repented of their sin and continued, and continued in God's favor. One did not, being King Saul. King Saul never, never really repented of what he was doing, the things he was doing and he paid the price for it. David sinned against Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba when he, he called her up and they had, a, had an adulterous affair and then he sent Uriah the Hittite in. But, and we'll see it in a minute, but he repented and that's the key. You know, we were listening on the radio this morning coming in and the thing, the thing is, is God, Jesus Christ died for all our sins. And when he died, I hadn't even been thought of yet, but he still died for my sins that I would do once I was in the flesh, once I was born, just as he died for yours. But we, we need to look at the idea, and we'll get to, to David's uh, Repentance here in a second. But Acts 13, 22, 25 says, And when he, he had removed him, he raised, raised up for them David. And when it says, When he removed him, God removed Saul from his kingship. He was king for a good while while David was waiting to be king. David had opportunities to eliminate Saul, but he would not do anything to injure or kill Saul's anointed, uh, God's anointed. So that's why Saul, Saul stayed in power until God removed him. But then it goes on, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel the Savior, Jesus, after John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Now, this is Paul still talking in the synagogue. We don't need, we don't need to lose track of who's talking but as I said Paul just like Stephen just like Peter at Pentecost they, he is telling the history the sort of history of, of Israel the things that they did they didn't do when it talks about David said the man after my own heart said what God saw in David was a deep desire to do his will but he was human he stumbled he stumbled But throughout David's entire life, his drive never changed to do the will of God. Unlike King Saul, who was a self-willed man, was a self-willed man, King David confessed his sins and quickly repented of them, as we see in Psalm 51. 
Now, when you look at Psalm 51, we're not going to look at the whole psalm. We're going to look at the first three verses. But the first three verses says, Psalm, uh, David is crying out to God, said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Now David is a model for the believer because when we transgress, we break, break our relationship with Jesus. When we're, we, 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 we oftentimes use repent, and I mentioned this last week, I think it was. We use repent in, in an incorrect manner. We say, well, I woke up this morning and I repented for everything I did yesterday. Well, repent is change of attitude, change of position, change in direction. And if you repent, if you were truly repenting every day or every time you did something, you repented, which means when you repent, you, you're agreeing with, with Christ. You're walking in his path. You're walking in his direction. You're walking in his way. Then something happens and you skirt off over here and you have to repent to get back. But in truth, you repent once. You repent and you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins, to take the sins of your life away from you, give you a new heart. And what you want is really conviction and confession. We want to be convicted of our sin. When we, when we sin, you know, a lot of people say, well, my conscience said that's conviction. That's Holy Spirit conviction. When you're convicted by the Holy Spirit of your sin, you don't have to repent if you've already repented. If you're a blood-washed, twice-born child of God, you don't have to repent. Again, what you do have to do is confess your sin to restore your fellowship with Christ. See, what happens is when we, when we ask Jesus Christ to be the, the, the Lord of our life, we confess our sins, we're convicted by the Holy Spirit, that we're a sinner, we need a Savior. Then we go along. But what happens, what happens is we have an unbreakable relationship with God, Father, in heaven. That's the penalty of sin. When Christ went to the cross, he paid the penalty for your sin, which is the second death. If you read, you read that in Revelation 20, 21, 22, I believe it is. But he, he died for the penalty of your sin. He didn't die for the consequences of your sin. You have to take care of the consequences yourself. Because if you go rob a bank and shoot the bank guard, and they come get you and say, whoa, whoa, man, I, I'm good. I, Jesus went to the cross for me. No, he went to the cross that when, when we execute you, you'll still go to heaven. But he he's didn't die for you to rob a bank and, and kill, a, kill a guard. So... There's a difference between the penalty of sin, which Jesus died for, and the consequences of our sin. Now, as I said, David is the model for the believer because when he transgresses and breaks our fellowship with Jesus, it can only be restored through our conviction by the Holy Spirit and confession to the God-man Jesus. But the twice-born, blood-washed believer should repent when they come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's when you repent is when you come to faith in Jesus Christ. After that, we should confess our sin because our fellowship with Jesus can't be restored until we do. John the baptizer knew who he was and what his mission was. He was the one crying out in the wilderness that the Savior of the world was coming. He knew he wasn't the one for whom he was making the way straight. He was brought into this world for one purpose and that was the same as each one of us who believed to point. Point people to Jesus, the one who through his own blood saves our saves us from sin. Now Acts 13, 13 26 through 30 says, Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this, this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every... And this is key. It said, 
Not even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condem condemning, the condemning him. And, through the, and though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he might that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but raised him, but God raised him on the third day, or raised him from the dead. Anyway, basically what they're saying is, as you guys read all this stuff, every, every Sabbath, y'all read this in the synagogue, but yet still he came and John the Baptist identified him, said who he was, he said, Jesus said who he was, but you still, you took him and you executed him, though he had done nothing to be executed for. But the key is, they took him, uh, now is, uh, verse 29 says, now when they had fulfilled all that was written according to him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in his tomb. So all that he was supposed to do, all he came for, now we look at it and say, what if Jesus had somehow escaped the cross? If he'd escaped the cross, then he would have been doing what Satan wanted him to do. Because that's what the temptation of Jesus was about, to get him to bypass the cross. If he bypassed the cross, we'd still be in a lost condition. It was the cross and the empty tomb that makes the difference. With his death and resurrection, Jesus fulfilled the words of the prophets about his first coming. Paul in his message continues to accuse, exhort, and educate the Jews about what happened with Jesus. Each of the things that happened were foretold in God's word by the prophets. We as believers in the Lord Jesus can be in a tight situation when we see that had Jews believed, had they accepted Jesus as their Messiah and not facilitated his death on the cross, then we would still be lost in our sin. We are only saved through his blood sacrifice on the cross and guaranteed heaven by the empty tomb. He came to seek and save that which was lost, and he could not do that short of the cross because as we read in Luke 22, 42, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So there was no other way for us to be redeemed. There was no other way for us to be saved and called out. It, other than through him going to the cross and him accepting, was willingly accepting it. That, that's the hard part. He willingly accepted it. You know, the, the, the prayer in uh, verse 42 of Luke 2, he was asking, but he didn't go into a big, long diatribe about, man, God, Father God, if you just, just do something else. Let, let's, let's kill another lamb or something. Let's do something else said, but if there's not any other way, let's go ahead and do it the way, the way it's been set up since the beginning of creation, since before the first stone of creation was laid. But you know, as I said just a second ago, that's what Satan was wanting to happen. Satan, I imagine when, when Jesus was praying in the garden, he said, Father, if you could take this cup away from me, Satan's over here, yeah, yeah, take the cup away from him. Find another way. Let's just do it without the cross. We can do it without the cross. But then when he went to the cross, Satan said, well, he, he, he's, he's dead now, so I obviously still got victory. But that was his greatest defeat. That was Satan's greatest defeat when, when uh, Jesus went to the cross because that was the time that all sin was paid for for those who believed. Now, Acts 13, 31, 34 says, he was seen for many days. This is still Paul talking. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. Who are his witnesses to the people? And declare to you glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and that he raised him from the dead no more to return to corruption he has spoken thus i will give you the sure mercies of david now paul testifies to the jews in the synagogue that jesus they had crucified was raised and seen alive 
Scripture states that he was seen alive by the apostles and more than 500 believers. 1 Corinthians 15, 6 says, And after that, he was sent, seen by 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to, at the pre, to the present. I think most of them are gone now. But some have fallen asleep. Paul is telling the Jews that many saw the risen Savior alive, that the majority of those are still living. Nothing for most people trumps, trumps eyewitness testimony. For these Jews were not going to go down believing. Now, what Paul is trying to get across to him is everything that the Jews meant for, for evil, meant for bad, worked out to a good. You know, I, I've got it in here somewhere, but I'm going to hit on it now. Did we all realize that Satan is not equal with God. He's not on the same level. He's not on the same footing. He doesn't have any power over God. He doesn't have any power to make God do anything. God has Satan on the leash like a dog. He can't go just so far and God will snatch him back. But the things that Satan does, Satan will uh, formulate his plans. He'll do things. And God sits there and says, yeah, I can use that to, to, get, my will, to get my will accomplished over here. So every time, even when he's scheming against God, he's doing things that help fulfill God's will. All these things that are going on in the world today, Satan's behind all of this stuff. And all this stuff is going to be used by God for his glory. Go to uh, 35, 15, 35, uh, 35 and 37. says, therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. He whom God raised up saw no corruption. Paul argued that David could not have been speaking of himself in Psalm 1610, as in verse 35. When David died, his body was returned to dust, just like everyone else's. As Peter commands, as Peter comments in Acts 2, 29, 31, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you from the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now, when we talk about Hades, we're not talking about Hades was a place of the, the dead. You had two levels to Hades. You had Hades, the place of torment. You had Hades, which was paradise. When he, when he, and when he went to the cross, when he died and he descended, he descended to, to the, the paradise to cleanse that with his own blood because everybody who was in paradise said that when he went to the cross, were, were saved through faith in what God's Word said. And they were looking forward to the cross. The Old Testament saints looked forward to the cross. We looked back at the cross. But we were all cleansed by the same blood, the same shed blood of Jesus. And that's what he's talking about when he goes to Hades. He's not going down to where the unrepentant, unsaved, unredeemed are. He's going to where the redeemed were. And he, he cleansed uh, Paradise with his own shed blood and took it to heaven. But in all this, David was talking about the Messiah and who would be raised from the dead as the final proof of his divine sonship, as we see in Romans 1 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul's message to the Jews was really succinct. 
they had crucified the Savior, the Jewish Messiah. But Paul could have could have said with all authority, as it is written in Isaiah 53, 3, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Now Isaiah is clear in his testimony that the Lord would be rejected when he came in the flesh. But in truth, he came into this life to give his life a ransom for many, as we read in Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Finally, Acts 13, 38-41. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what, what has been spoken and the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which will by no means believe. You will, a work which you will by no means believe though one were to declare it to you. Everyone who believes is justified. Justification is a legal term meaning declared innocent. It is a legal declaration that a person is acquitted and absolved. It's justification. It's by justification that a person is righteous and acceptable to God. The death of Christ was the payment for our sin death so that we might be forgiven. All of this preaching that Paul did to the to the people in the synagogue at uh, Antioch of uh, uh, Pisidia. All of this was to bring them, it was not to sit here and accuse them and say, this is what you dirty scums did. This is what happened. You need to believe so you can be saved. Because his, his goal was not to, uh, to confront them. His goal was to tell them what was going on, what happened in the history of the Jewish people, and what happened with the Messiah, what happened with the Lord Christ Jesus, to tell them what happened, that he was the Messiah, he was the one who came and was the perfect sacrifice, that they just needed to believe. And that was his goal. You know, when you read it, even, even with Stephen, when, when he was, when he was, he really had a good message. But when he was talking to them, he was condemning them, but he wasn't condemning them to hell. He was condemning them in their hearts so they would reach out to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, to be saved. That was the whole goal. That was Peter's goal when he was preaching on the day of Pentecost to 3,000 were saved. He preached the truth to them. He preached that you guys had a hand in crucifying the, the Messiah. You, you guys had a hand in but he died for you, even though you're the ones that hung him on the tree, and you're the ones that beat him, he still died for you, he died for your sins, and he is willing and looking for you to come to faith and be saved. And that's what we're called to do, is we're called to share the gospel with as many people as we possibly can. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, I, I love this, I, I saw this, and it's for all, everybody that's got children. Teach me to follow Jesus before the world teaches me how to follow them. One second, Miss Terry. <laughs> 